fast alone like more than one and a half hours and the Kathak is laughing and uh, uh, Narhasti is in fact in the methodology of collapsulation so I know there's some ways to measure in the total level of glycolation, is there any way to distinguish from the, you know, dis the end from the old glycolation? Any so, how do you distinguish the end glycans from old glycans? And analysis you cannot, but there's a technique that you can use. There's an enzyme called PNGAs. So the question is, you have glycan protein with both end glycans, old glycans, so how do you separate end glycans from old glycans? And so hydrogenolysis cannot distinguish end glycans from old glycans because you have all of them get released. And what you do that, you use an enzyme called PMGASEF. PMGASEA. This tool selectively releases only end glycans, but not the old glycans. This is called peptide N glycanase F. Peptide N glycanase A. The abbreviation is PNGSF, PNGSA. And PNGSF is pretty good for most of the N glycans, but once you have a few course residue, alpha 1 6 linked uh, to the Kuiper Bios unit, or alpha 1 3 free course linked to the Kuiper Bios unit, then the PNGSF doesn't work. Then you have to use PNGSA. So it's sometimes better to first use PNGSF to release the N glycans, and then treat with PNGSA. To release fecosylated culture bios, trimarginal culture bios containing end glycans. So, therefore, you also can confirm that they have a fecos residue. And then they also have, I think, old glycanase. I'm not fully completely aware of the specificity and so forth. But if you really want to separate end glycans from old glycans, I would recommend you use PNGs F and PNGs A. And then you do hydrogen analysis of the protein uh, at 65 degrees Celsius, then you get old glycans. Then you can compare the old glycan profile with end glycan profile. Any other questions? So let's move on to sialic acids and glycolipids. I tried to go a little bit fast. And uh, so the sialic acid, okay, we're going to look at the function of sialic acids, the biosynthesis, and the structures of sialic acid. And also, we're going to look a little bit about New York, okay, MS2 aromatic acids, the N-glycol aromatic acid, and how the sialic acid plays a role in viral and bacterial infections, and also the congenital desirous of glycosylation associated with the sialic acid. Then we we'll focus on glycolipids in which black hands attach to lipids, the various lipid conjugates, the biological roles, biosynthesis, metabolism, genetic diseases. So sialic acids, very important, very different as important as and the fertilization of the egg sperm interactions, the egg interaction with sperm, and they are heavily glycosylated outside. And there's a recent paper published by Anne Dell from uh, United Kingdom, uh, the King's College, I think, uh, shown how sialic acid is so critical for egg sperm interactions. So there's a simple end like uh, gold glycans, simple uh, glyco okay, proteins and glycolipids, and often capped with sialic acid. Those sialic acids are very critical for facilitating interactions because you have sialic acid on one side of the egg and then sperm has a protein that can bind or vice versa. So these egg sperm interactions needs a sialic acid and the sialic acid binding uh, lectins or proteins and is important. And that sialic acid has been shown to be very important for development if you knock out sialic acid synthesis and then it has huge consequences in development. Many organs fail completely. Also, I've been showing that sialic acid is important for learning and cognitive functions because many of the glycolipids which are exposed, okay, in the nervous system very specifically, they're like ganglioides, okay, they're actually from ganglions, and uh, so globocytes which are again found specifically in the nervous system. And uh, so those glycans play a major role in action, guidance, action, regeneration, and growth besides the proto-glycans. Uh, and so again, they play a role in okay, learning and cognitive functions. They also play a role in, though I say it's acquired disease, not, okay, not quite, sometimes inherited disease as well. There's a cancer in which, as I said in the previous slide, there's a truncated okay, uh, glycans attached to the museums and because of upper regulation of serial transfers, a down regulation of serial transfers. Also various pathogens, okay, where, okay, unfortunately, the gonas of sialic acid can trigger the viral infection as simple as a flu or complex as meningitis. 
And so in the very first, okay, okay, when I talked about various sugars gets activated, without activating, you can transfer them to the lipids or proteins or other carbohydrates. So in the, in the case of sialic acid, which is very unique, it can be activated only as CMP sialic acid, whereas other sugars can be activated as a UDP sugars or GDP, whereas sialic acid is activated as a CMP, okay, sialic acid residue, and then can be donated to the various uh, glycans or lipids and proteins. And uh, so this slide just summarizes exactly what, how various conversion takes place. And let's focus on uh, this slide now. And so what happens is that unlike other sugar nucleotides, which are synthesized in the cytoplasm, the CMP sialic acid, the activation of sialic acid takes place in the nucleus. But the activation of glucose, galactose, mannose, xylose, Butyric acid, everything takes place in the cytoplasm, with the exception of sialic acid. Sialic acid activation takes place in nucleus too. We don't understand why. So maybe sialic acid is so critical it cannot be controlled in the cytoplasm manner. It has to be controlled in the nuclear manner. Maybe we don't know why. But what happens that your UDP glucanate now is epimerized into enoster mannosamine. Then the UDP gets clipped off. I mean you have. Phosphorylation happens in the sixth position. It forms a six phosphorylated N mannose. And then phosphorylated pyruvate combines to make the sialic acid 9 phosphate. And then the 9 phosphate gets cleaned off to form this 9 carbon sialic acid, the structure is shown here. And then the sialic, all these things happen inside the plasm. And then sialic acid gets into the nucleus where it gets activated in CMP sialic acid and then gets transported into the Golgi. Again, you need a transporter to transport the CMP sialic acid from nucleus to outside, from outside to the Golgi, and then where, with the help of CLL transferase, we can transfer sialic acid to six positions of galactose or galactosamine, or three positions of galactose or galactosamine, or nine positions of, or eight positions of sialic acids. And so, end up in making complex glycoconjugates could be glycolipids or glycoproteins, then they get displayed on the cell surface. Often when they have sialic acid, they are displayed on the cell surface. As far as I know, I haven't come across a glycoconjugate which is internally located inside the cell, which has sialic acid. But oftentimes they are outside on the cell surface. And also, a number of groups that are exploited, including uh, Bertosis and Kevin Erima and John Hopkins and uh, Lara Mahal, in the, okay, they, when they do that, they, this enzyme can tolerate many different okay, uh, functional groups. Okay, in particular, NSL group. You don't need to have an NSL group. You can put n oil, n benzoyl, number of other okay, azide. So then you can make a functionalized sialic acid and gets displayed as a functionalized sialic acid. You can have an azide, or you can have a tubidon containing molecule, or you have a sulfur group, like a, a such group, thiohydro, okay? And then you can conjugate with nanoparticles, particles, can conjugate with various things, and you can put the fluorophore, you can visualize what kind of sialic acid expressed by the expression cell surface. So this is how being exploited by a Bertosis group and also Kevin Yarimon or a Mahal group. So now let us go back to the previous slide. And there are slight differences in the synthetic pathways in humans and in bacteria. If you look at in bacteria, maybe it's very hard for you to see my slide. And so they go from gluconic 6 phosphate into nanox 6 phosphate directly. So you have a gluconic 6 phosphate becomes a nanox 6 phosphate, and a still nanosamine 6 phosphate, and catalyzed by the enzyme epimerase. Whereas in humans, we don't do that way. So when you do that, you need UDP gluconic, and then it's converted into n acetyl monosamine. So you have an activated gluconic, UDP gluconic, epimerase acts on that and epimerizes into n acetyl monosamine, maybe UDP, but gets killed off. As it gets epimerized, it gets kicked off in the UDP residue. So the enzyme found in vertebrates and in humans, which can only work on UDP gluconac and then epimerizes them into nanac. And whereas in bacteria, and we don't have that enzyme, different enzyme, and that enzyme epimerizes the gluconac 6 phosphate directly into nanac 6 phosphate without need for activation. So a number of pharmaceutical company knows that this epimerase is not required for the humans, and therefore trying to develop an inhibitor, specifically targeting this epimerase, which are found only in bacteria, but not in humans, but so far they have not been successful. I don't understand why. And uh, so this is a bacteria-specific enzyme, that means you express an E. coli, you should be able to get a good crystal structures, to be able to do modeling and get, figure out what kind of inhibitor you need to develop, but it has not been built, it has not been so far successful yet. I don't understand that quite why. It's a very nice target, for big farmers to focus directly to affect the vital infection. So coming back, one more thing, okay? And 
N acetyl glucose, uh, N acetyl sialic acid is found in humans, whereas in chimpanzees, you can see N glycolyl uh, sialic acid. And also in other species, we can see N glycolyl sialic acid. Whereas in humans, it has been proposed that uh, the gene that okay, converts N acetyl into N glycolyl is not absent, is there, but silenced. Because in order for the gene to be transcribed at 5 prime region, where the transcription factor binds and translates, and that's where the mutation occurred. So you have an intact gene exists that is silenced in the form of protein because of the 5 region where the mutation occurred, therefore transcription factor cannot bind in humans, and therefore they are not translated into protein in humans. We have an active gene, but the gene is not transcribed because of uh, the 5 region regions mutated in humans. So Ajit Verki, you know, who is always fascinated by this kind of mostly sialic acid, has proposed that we look at the human genome and the chimpanzee genome, which he had access as soon as the genome sequence came out, and he is at very high end level compared to the people. He found first things so fascinating, only very few gene differences you can see between humans and the chimpanzee. One of the gene differences is that the gene is silenced in humans, but is still active in chimpanzee. So, he proposes, and also many are thinking now, maybe perhaps that explains our cognitive functions. So what happens if you turn on this enzyme, which converts the N-acetyl into n glycolyl in humans, what happens? Would you become like a chimpanzee? Of course, it's a very hard question to address. And that you can work with chimpanzee instead, and the primary research center, where you can make uh, these the chimpanzees to be silencing the enzyme, which converts the n acetyl into n glycolyl, then what happens? You think chimpanzee becomes like a human? It's possible, but I think it's too dangerous to carry out that kind of research. Maybe many top secret research is going on all over the world by government agencies to trying to figure out, you know, they don't admit to okay, publicly okay, doing private research. But I am convinced that okay, this may perhaps tell us something about the biological significance of NDI colors and acetyl in cognitive functions. Of course, there's ethical issues involved. If you silence this gene in chimpanzee, it becomes like a human, what you do with them? Okay? And so I don't know the answer for those ethical questions. But I think it's very interesting interviewing to the fact that we don't have N-glycolyl uh, sialic acid, but MSP sialic acid we have. And also it has been shown that N-glycolyl sialic acid may be produced in humans uh, during cancer progression. And uh, some number of other people have shown that in the tumor tissues, N-glycolyl is produced maybe somehow under means the cancer cell, as you know, that they are under constant mutation so rapidly. And it's possible that now the gene is turned on, supposed to be silenced in the 5 prime region because the transcription that cannot bind. Now, because of the cancer genome is so unstable, the under of mutations, accidentally they can turn on the gene, so they can start making N glycolyl sialic acid, which is supposed not to be there. That may perhaps explain why in tumor patients we always see the microthrombi, which is one of the common things you see. the as a prognostic tools in tumor fashions, they are micro trauma, small, small trauma formation occurs. And that's why treatment, uh, treatment of the cancer patient with the happen seems to be very beneficial. They are micro trauma formation, and that's how the tumor cells can protect themselves by having the platelets surrounding them and uh, protecting against immune cells attacking them, recognizing them. So there's not one factor, but now turning on the gene, you can make N-glycolic sialic acid, and this N-glycolic sialic acid now maybe it triggers uncontrolled growth, one possibility. And second thing is that it also has been shown by a number of other groups that plated maturation, which start by megakaryocytosis and, uh, I don't know, uh, right name, megakaryocytosis. Yeah, cytosis. In which what happened that blood cells develop from a specific, okay, uh, the, uh, the stem cell population, and there's a specific lineage in all process involved. It has been shown that in this uh, maturation of the blood cells and platelets and so forth productions, and they switch from uh, N acetyl to N glycolyl, uh, N glycolyl to N acetyl. So when you start expressing N glycolyl in platelets, and they can start aggregation, they can trigger the aggregation of the platelets. So it's possible that in the tumor populations, in the tumor patients, N glycolyl enzymes turn on, you have N glycolyl sialic acid produced, now the platelets aggregate, this is not the aggregating, now the aggregating, then by aggregating the platelets, now the tumor cells can themselves be protected by the microthrombi, and then that leads to progress in cancer, and also aggregate, okay, uh, okay, they can avoid the immune cell attack by them and eventually they can log into some other places, they can uh, trigger other things. And also, it's interesting to me, this specific uh, n glycol aromatic acid, because it is also expressed in pig, it is also expressed in primates, and so one of the major goals of our program project is to transplant in the pig organs in humans. If the pig can express n glycol sialic acid, 
how you then you can transplant your pig organ to humans. The one is a high that we were focusing on, but other thing that we need to be aware of the fact that the pig cells, pig organs can express uh, n glycolic nomenic acid. There's a group recently in Korea, they also have access to transgenic pig. They've shown that n glycolic sialic acid containing glycolipids and glycoproteins dramatically uh, increased when the transplant of the pig organs in humans. And uh, so that may trigger coagulation cascade. And also, I was just talking to Iraq just a few minutes ago that the pig cell specific tissue factors can be very different from human tissue factors. So they have different end glycosylations, oscillations, different old glycosylations, oscillations, and then they can affect their half life and their functions. And so instead of functioning as an now they can be pro coagulant. So now we're talking about we're getting into an area that's much more complex. And but what I think is important for you to recognize all of us that glycans play a major role in many ways than just one pathway we can think of. So they play in the cancer, inflammations, the dysfunctions, and also can affect uh, xenotransplantation. So various pathogens also, okay, uh, recognizes the sialic acid, the influenza which causes uh, uh, the flu in uh, humans. And that virus uh, has two proteins on the cell surface. One is hemoagglutinin, which is uh, sialic acid binding lectin. And then is a sialidase enzyme, which puts up sialic acid. What happens is that on human host cells, the sialic acid containing glycans are expressed like the conjugates. The first thing that happens is that this hemoagglutinin produced by a virus and binds to sialic acid containing like a conjugate in your host cells, human host cells. And then the sialidase enzyme clips all the sialic acid. By clipping, by clipping of sialic acid, it facilitates their entry. Of course, a number of other groups can up, okay, argue against that uh, aspect. They say that it facilitates their exit. But I think that I believe both for entry and exit, uh, sialidase is required. So the sialidase is produced and expressed on the surface of the virus. And uh, so by clipping of the sialic acid, which has a negative charge, and then it can facilitate the entry of the cell. Of course, you have a sulfate glycan, and glycan, which has more negative charge. But one of the theories is that by clipping of sialic acid, you can reduce the overall charge density, negative charge, and which can facilitate the entry into the host cell, in this case, human cells. And they can multiply, they can produce more viruses, and then they have to exit. So even for exit, they need to have sialidase enzyme, therefore they can clip out the sialic acid and they can just take off. So both for entry and exit, I believe the sialidase enzyme plays a role, but a number of other groups claims that sialidase enzymes require to clip out sialic acid only for exit, not for the entry. And this is open to debate. But nevertheless, pharma company exploited this knowledge to target the uh, influenza virus. And I would like to bring you like, uh, about differences about human flu and avian flu. Human flu one, that's fed from, okay, from to me, and from you, me to you. And that's a human flu that comes from human to human. And that virus, they're going to say sialic acid alpha 2 6 lactose, a sialic acid alpha 2 6 lactose, I mean. And this glycan, a glycolipid, a glycoprotein, a glycoconjugate, express an upper respiratory tract in, okay, in human lungs. And what it means that the virus gets into the lung and they explain upper tract. So you will hear a guy from Prem, he didn't like me, so he gave it to me before he leaves Salt Lake City. So I get it. And so I gave it to Umes otherwise, then he will give it to everybody in his hometown. So what it's basically is transferable because it's upper respiratory tract. When I cough, okay, when I okay, exhale, things just can easily dislodge and can get out. And but good thing is that it's not lethal. You'll be sick for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And but that's about it's not, most of the time it's non lethal unless you're immunocompromised, it become lethal. There's the avian flu, which transfers from birds to the humans, which is dangerous, you all know that. And that virus recognizes a sialic acid alpha 2 3 galactose, a sialic acid alpha 2 3 galactose, I mean. And this structure exposed deep inside your lung, not an upper tract, but lower tract. So, virus, when you inhale, it goes inside, it cannot bind anywhere, it's still looking for a place to bind. And then eventually finds it, but it finds this partner, sialic acid alpha to 3 lactose, deep inside the respiratory tract. That means that you just cough, you don't come out, it just stays deep inside. And so what happens is that it's going deep inside, it keeps multiplying, 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 and then it causes an internal hemorrhage. Okay, then organs fail, like it causes a bleeding, internal bleeding. And this is not transferable from human to human. And eventually the first son dies. So the human to human is non-lethal, but transferable, but the avian flu is a lethal, but non-transferable. But it's a question of when we can switch this virus instead of regulating sialic acid alpha 2 3 to alpha 2 6. We all know the virus can keep constantly mutating. I believe one day, hopefully not in my lifetime, this may switch from alpha 2 3 to alpha 2 6. You remember that 
this hemalkin binds to alpha 2, 6. But if you start binding to alpha 2, uh, 2, 3, instead of alpha 2, 3, this uh, avian flu into alpha 2, 6, what happens? Now, it's a lethal, it binds up a track, you cough, it goes next person, this person, then not only you die, your neighbors also die, it's become lethal and transferable. And it's a question of when, it's not if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's a question of when. So, that's why the government was always worried if this kind of virus gets into the hands of carriers and they can use as a bioterrorism weapons and so forth. So, but naturally it may not happen, but if there's a possibility it could happen, the mutations is a question of when. And uh, so we need to prepare for that. Uh, so number of companies using uh, the a a enzyme mo molecule that inhibits Cialidase enzyme, the Relenza and Tamiflu, basically both of them mimic a Cialic acid and bind to Cialidase enzyme and inhibits Cialidase enzyme or viral Cialidase and thereby preventing uh, the infection. So the Tamiflu and Relenza are prescribed for those who have you know, extreme flu infections of food. And, but the problem is that it has some side effects. It has been shown to cause some psychiatric behaviors okay, um, in elderly population in Japan and also in some European countries. It has not been okay, tied anywhere else, but one of the drugs has been shown to cause a psychiatric problems in a very small populations. And we don't know whether it's a pharmacogenomic specific, is a specific populations or not, but it has been shown that it can cause in psychiatric abnormal problems. But one of the drugs, I don't quite remember, Relanza or Tamiflu. Uh, the Tamiflu, I know, is uh, rarely available, you can take as a pill. And whereas the Relanza is not rarely available as a pill, and uh, so you have to inhale it. And people who have the respiratory problem, and they can't inhale it. Then, it, then these people cannot take the relanza, they have to take the Tamiflu. Now the Tamiflu can be given to the children, uh, but the relanza cannot be given to the young children. And there's the differences are there. So I'd like to stop here now, and I think we'll take a break, and then uh, I think I don't have the time to cover like a repeat part of it, but I think there are slides, I think that if you have time, we can pick up later on. That's okay, Dr. Desai? So, Yes, we have a question, sorry. I think I kind of want to that. So, you said uh, one of the virus is non-lethal, the other is lethal. Yes. Does it have to do anything with, uh, with differential recognition of the other acids or it does not? Yes. Because this virus recognizes alpha-2,6 lactose. Whereas this virus recognizes alpha, sialic acid alpha-2,3 lactose. Different linkages. But this structure expressed only in the upper track. Whereas this structure expressed only in the lower tract. It's also possible the human flu right now, which is non lethal and it can switch to sialic acid alpha 2 3 lactose. Then it is still non lethal and non transferable, which is better, which can also can happen. And uh, so non lethal and non transferable is better, okay? <laughs> and then having lethal and transferable is bad. And it's, so this virus can equally can switch from alpha 2 6 to 2 3, then it can only go and bind to deeper inside. But since it's non lethal, and probably it's just going to be contained inside, then you have to use antiviral drugs, something to treat the person. Because it won't go away unless you treat them somehow eventually. So the virus uh, increase, only the virus increase dependent on the recognition? Yes. Um, I mean, its effect or its manifestation is not. Yeah, yeah. Binding is okay, recognized by the external structures because it uh, binds specific structures. But the virus, okay, lethality is not limited with this gene that recognizes sialic acid. There's other genes that involve. That's why it's avian flu is different from human flu. That's why avian flu is often commonly transferred to one bird to other bird. But if ever transferred to the humans because of human contact and whatnot, and we still don't understand completely, when that happens, then it becomes very bad. That's why it's not very common, human flu trans okay, transfection in humans. But if that's going to happen, it's just very bad. Yes, any questions? Okay, I'm sure you all learn more about black hands now. Sialic acids and, and, okay. Good, so we'll take a break now. It's a sweet time. Coffee, so I add sugar. Oh,